people that don't have experience in this world, they've played Call of Duty, and they assume that the real world is like that, and I can promise you it's not. You don't know where your enemy is, you don't know what they have, you don't know where they are, you don't know any of this. And this is out, out in the desert where we are supporting various space defense operations for, for the Air Force. Right out of college, I was doing some research with the Army Corps and the Naval Expeditionary Warfare Center building autonomous systems and, and advanced field sensors for, for the military. We built some you know, early systems that sort of reached the scale where you have to then deploy that system into the field, into real operations and, and support real real missions. At that stage, the technology hit this wall that most technologies in defense hit. You know, it's so common they have, they have a name for it. It's the Valley of Death. People just assume, okay, we're going to go throw a camera out into the desert. What happens with that information? How do you power it? How do you supply communications? How do you actually do that operationally? You can imagine as a, some troops on the ground, you want to know not just what's happening on the ground, say visual cameras or thermal cameras. You want to know what's happening in the air. You use radar systems. You want to potentially understand what's happening on the electromagnetic spectrum. You're going to have all these different fronts of information. The problem is today, it's tied into very vertical systems where each of these systems is a fully integrated end-to-end -end, end -end device, which means that you're using what they call the swivel chair method. You look and system A, then system B, then system C. And as a user in a really high pressure scenario, it's your job to then make sense of that information, which is, as you can imagine, very, very error prone and, and, and really slow. We see ourselves as solving this middleware problem and solving the infrastructure problem in defense that has not yet been solved. That was kind of the core inspiration for the company in the first place. So we're in El Segundo, California on Main Street. We are in our R&D and manufacturing space. So this is our kind of flagship uh, hardware platform lander. This provides the power comms and compute for various downstream payloads. A couple of them are here. That's one of the, the standard ones, the visual infrared camera. We have a thermal camera over there, radar system. This is one that everyone seems to love. So this is kind of a mess in here. This is just our test unit, but this whole thing is actuated. So that'll lay itself flat, which means that you're reducing the cross-sectional areas so you can survive really high winds. One of the design constraints we have is this system needs to be able to survive for about 10 years of operation, including in areas where you have extreme winds, so category five hurricane force. We have survived with this system in this setup, a tropical storm out in Florida this past year. The early systems did not look anything like this. <laughs> you need to solve the power use, you need to solve the compute, uh, and the comms for any ISR system we deploy in the field. And then on top of that, we build the software systems underneath that to support the larger operations of what's happening on, on the installation. This system, you know, it's, it's sort of reached design maturity and a lot of our attention these days is focused on, on this system, which we call Helios. Helios takes a lot of the learnings and a lot of the capabilities and actually the exact same software stack that we developed for Lander and deploys it into fast moving or sort of mobile missions. Um, this was inspired a lot by the Air Force where they had requirements to deploy different ISR and communications payloads in four to sort of fast moving scenarios. One of these systems is actually out in, in Ukraine right now supporting uh, expeditionary ISR applications um, for, for the Ukrainian uh, Ministry of Defense. Every payload we developed for one of these systems is interoperable between the two. What that means is we're sort of continuously growing this ecosystem of payloads, supporting more and more missions. And, you know, we're sort of eagerly bringing in different partners that are building these different systems, these sensors or cameras or radar systems or microphones or whatever the, the emerging challenges are uh, for the military and for our end users, bringing in partners to help support that. Lander was built really to serve the specific needs for, for base defense and, and training operations out of the Air Force. Folks that I've been working with for years at this point and were really struggling to understand what was happening holistically across that installation. So this is what it actually looks like in, in operation. This is actually a real use case out here. And this is out, out in the desert at one of our largest and longest installations. So this is one of our lander systems out in the field. And so right now we're streaming to about 600 miles into the desert where you know, there's very little that happens most of the time. You can uh, actually control this camera in real time, which makes it possible for the end users at a base or, or even, I mean, even where we are today to be doing a hell of a lot uh, with these systems. You can you know, zoom these things in yeah, incredibly far. You know, it's looking for trespassing, it's looking for uh, monitoring training activity, monitoring uh, fighter jets that are in the air. This is one of the main sites for the F-35 program. You know, it's also sort of less interesting things, right? You have people in, in public access areas will just kind of stray off the wrong road and now they're in a really dangerous area. You have different uh, endangered species that the military is bound to, to help support and monitor. And so this system really was built to help serve those seemingly very different missions but do so on that infrastructure level, right? You need to solve the power use, you need to solve the compute and the comms for any ISR system you deploy in the field. 
So I think one of the big challenges that we faced early on was, you know, realizing that it's not a hardware problem, it's not a software problem. This is a technology problem where we need to be able to deploy different payloads into the field and support that information and pull that data back to where it needs to go. And so for us, kind of the name of the company and actually where the, the first systems we built came from were addressing those problems. That we needed to deploy the systems out in the field in the first place before we do anything with that information. One of the core, you know, hard parts of building this company is we had to really address that head on and we did. Where now you have the technology and, and by controlling all the way down to the physical level, you have just a lot more control over what's happening and the quality of the product at the end of the day versus relying on really outdated systems that most of the other companies out in this space kind of build at. You know, in doing so, we can really support all the way to the payload level this technology that very few companies can do. We can support a whole bunch of different companies that are emerging in this space in deploying those payloads into, into real operations without having to worry about all the infrastructure underneath that. Everything between that payload and the end user, that's what we saw. So kind of what's on, on top of our mind right now is, is opening up this platform, opening up the interface, opening up the, the API to allow any developer to, to build their systems into, into PicoGrid. Kind of why that's useful is it allows these systems and these companies, that infrastructure to make their systems operate kind of across the board. Right? You can imagine you're, you're building a drone system. Well, that drone system needs to know where it's flying and what's going on. You have cameras on the ground that can actually make that possible. You have radar systems that can help that. You have all these different devices built by different companies and they're all very, very advanced systems helping those work together. And kind of our focus right now is opening up that system up for, for anyone to build on top of. We're introducing technology that the militarians or the broader government has not had. For the DoD, it's just for the first time in a very, very long time, you're seeing the development of new technologies in this world. Our mission, our reason for being is to help make that possible at large scale, to build out the systems that our end users trust and that the partners we work with can actually deploy those systems into a trusted platform, into a trusted network that makes most companies more likely to succeed. For a very, very long time in this industry, there has been stagnation. There has been very little development. And if we can solve that even in a small way, I think we'd be success in helping these companies build the best technologies possible for the end user, for the military users, and that really desperately need new new systems without having to wait years or go massive over budget programs. We have the systems today to deploy cutting edge capabilities into the field. We're not talking about weeks, we're not talking about decades, we're talking about days. We can deploy a new software update to these systems in Ukraine within the next five minutes. Those systems would then be making that compatible with a whole new set of payloads. Those payloads have been out there to solve real problems for real end users, and we are in touch with them continuously to make that possible. That it seems obvious, right? That seems like something that should be possible, and it's just frankly not. And that's what we do, and that's what gets me up in the morning. What gets me excited to come to work, because I think, you know, to see the impact that this technology can have on so many different missions and so many different problem sets, even today, I'm continuously surprised as to the breadth of applications that this technology can solve that it was never built for, that it was never designed to solve. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what gets me excited. When I first saw the render of Lander on PicoGrid's website, I thought it was like the size of a desk. So when I got there in person and saw that it was like the size of a car, I thought that was so cool. And they also have a tiny one, don't worry, they don't just make giant systems. One thing that stood out to me from filming with Zane is just how serious he is about what he's building. He is lasered in on making great hardware and software to accompany it to solve real problems that he personally experienced. This is the 34th episode of S3 I filmed, and it's pretty rare to see a story where the founder was directly experiencing the problems they were facing in such a literal one-to-one -one way. Like Zane was trying to deploy sensor payloads like this for the military as a contractor, and then like he just saw there's no good solutions. He's like, fine, I will build it myself. That's gotta be like a deep tech motto at this point. It's just someone, that founder runs into a problem, like fine, I'll build it myself. I think the fact too, that there are a bunch of Lander and Hilo systems already deployed on US Air Force bases, in Ukraine, in other places, it's pretty cool to see that a company just a little over two years old already has systems that are working super reliably to systems that should last a long time and, you know, built in such a quick amount of time. In my mind, this is like a class act example of a deep tech and or defense tech company. Make it easier to handle the comms power and compute for payloads. Then also see the bigger picture problem, which is that all these softwares and different systems in military use don't have a great way to talk to each other. I am currently not in America. I I've been traveling for like nine days, filming something that is secret in a secret location. Uh, so this has been like scheduled a week in advance, which is a little nerve wracking for me because, you know, S3 is normally like pretty, pretty last minute. I hope to share with you soon where I've been, what I've been up to. But until then, thank you for watching and keep on building the future.